Pigman chapter 12. I wish this one would hurry up and croak because her husband has been getting a little too friendly lately. Yes, mother. Any man who can even think of flirting with another woman while his wife is on her deathbed deserves to be shot. Can I have 75 cents to get my blue dress out of the cleaners, I asked, though I could tell by the way she was fidgeting with her hairbrush that she was not finished with her own topic. Get it out of my pocketbook and hand me my compact while you're at it. She loosened the knot on her bathrobe and sat down at the kitchen table. He calls me out into the hall and asks how his wife is doing. And all the time he's got his hands in his pockets and he's given me this wink. I don't know what he heard about nurses, but I think I set him straight. I went into the bedroom and started straightening up, hoping she'd stop repeating herself. I looked him right in the eye and I said, Mr. Mooney, I think it would be a nice gesture if you went in and held your wife's hand. It might help her forget the pain from her cancer. I have to leave for school now, Mother, I said, wondering what she would do if she was taking care of Mr. Pignati. Give me a kiss. Be careful, Lorraine. Don't you think that skirt is a little too short? It's the longest skirt in the sophomore class. Don't be fresh. Just because all the other girls have sex on their mind doesn't mean you have to. Well, John wasn't at the bus stop that morning, but we finally got together during third period lunch. His hair was combed for the first time in months, and he actually had on a clean shirt. I could tell he was still charged up over our having the pig man's house to ourselves. I didn't get in until the start of second period. How come? Vore wanted to know how I could be missing 42 homework assignments and problems in American democracy, and I told him it was because I can't concentrate with a vacuum cleaner going all the time. Then he went off on this big new plan where he's going to check my homework every night, which will last for a day or two until he's too tired or busy. As he spoke, he dragged me to the payphone in the hall near the principal's office. Operator? Yes, sir. I just lost my dime trying to get St. Ambrose Hospital. I got some saloon by mistake. What number did you want? SA7-7295. I'll ring it for you. Thank you, operator. When the hospital answered, John passed the phone to me and stood in the hall to watch for any teachers because the kids aren't allowed to use the public telephone at Franklin High unless they get a special pass. And even then, it's got to be to call your mother to say that the school nurse has just diagnosed leprosy or something. They gave me the head nurse on Mr. Pignati's floor, and she told me he was going to be in for at least 72 hours, the danger period when a lot of people take that second attack and die. She sounded very nice when I told her I was his daughter, and she tried to explain something about his high-voltage machine they've got, which is supposed to come in handy if a second attack does come. Saturday would probably be the earliest he should leave. Thank you, ma'am. But don't worry about your father. We're taking very good care of him. Thank you. As soon as he wakes up from his morning nap, I'll tell him you called. I hung up. Is he all right? John asked. Fine, I smiled. John had the idea it was going to be great fun going over to that house by ourselves, but it didn't work out that way. Monday, we had the spaghetti dinner and put on those costumes, that was a lovely evening. It really was. I think when we looked at each other in the candlelight, it was the first time I was glad to be alive. I didn't know why exactly. It was sort of silly, I suppose, him with his mustache and me with the feather in my hair. But somehow it was as if I was being told about something, something wonderful, something beautiful waiting just for me. All I had to do was wait long enough. Tuesday night, I made TV dinners in the oven and burned them. They were supposed to be pork chops, but John said they looked more like fried dwarf sears. Wednesday after school, we stopped by the house for some beer and pretzels, but I knew I wasn't going to get out that night because my mother was on a war path over anti-fermenting the kitchen. Thursday, we didn't go over there at all because we really had to go to the library for this report for problems in American democracy. Read the amendments to the Constitution and condense the meaning of each into one succinct sentence. Also, answer the following. One, which amendment is most important in your life? Two, which amendment is least important? And three, which amendment would you make to the Constitution if you were President of the United States? 
On Friday, we cut school since it was the last day before Mr. Pignati was due home. We got to the house around 8.45 in the morning, and I went straight into the kitchen and started making breakfast. John wanted scrambled eggs with sloppy joe sauce, and that's what he got. I just had scrambled eggs with pizza-flavored ketchup. I burned the toast a little, and that was the first in a long list of complaints from Mr. John Conlon. Oh, he groaned. I'll put some more bread in. It's too late now. My eggs will get cold. Then he didn't like my coffee. I tried to explain to him that you can't ruin instant coffee, but he kept insisting I did. I showed him the directions on the label, how you take a level teaspoon and just add boiling water. But he insisted that there was some kind of skill involved. After breakfast, I asked him very nicely to take the garbage out, and he refused. Why should I put out the garbage when you're the one who makes it? You make just as much as I do. I do not. Your beer cans take up most of the space. Shut up and do the dishes. And that's the kind of day it started out to be. I wanted to put the place in order so that when Mr. Pignotti got back, he wouldn't find a pig house. But the way John was acting, I was beginning to feel sorry for his mother, if he was always so infantile at home. Could you do the dishes, I asked? No. You could do at least your own dishes. Every now and then, I'm startled at how good-looking John is, but he glared at me from under that shock of hair that fell across his brow and scared me a little. I knew something was bothering him, and I don't mean the dishes or the garbage. If I didn't know how maladjusted John is at times, I would have simply walked out of that house and not spoken to him again as long as I lived. But I let him pout in front of the television and watch a rerun of Doris's days called By the Light of the Silvery Moon. This particular mood in John had been building up ever since the night that he kissed me in the bedroom. I don't know whether he had just started thinking about our relationship, that I might possibly be something more than his straight man. I really don't know. But suddenly we had become slightly awkward in front of each other. Of course, I had always been clumsy around him, but at least I knew I had been in love with him for months. I also knew he liked me a lot, but only as a friend or a dreamboat with a leak in it. But now suddenly he was wearing shaving lotion, combing his hair, and fighting with me. There was something about all that which made me smile as I scraped the sloppy joe sauce off his plate. I'll take the garbage out now, he said, appearing in the doorway. I'd appreciate that very much. I'm only doing it because the pigman's coming home tomorrow and this hovel better look good. Of course. We really went to work on the house and fixed it up better than ever before. The only room we didn't touch was the one with the pigs in it. There was something almost religious about that room, as though it contained a spirit that belonged only to Mr. Pignati, and it was best left alone. Once, I had a nightmare about that room. I was walking down a long hall, and I saw the curtains on the doorway at the end. Even though I was dreaming, I knew exactly where I was, and I felt an icy chill run through me. I wanted to run away, but something was pushing me toward the curtains, and I started to scream for John. Help me! Help me, please! I couldn't stop my legs from moving closer and closer, as if large hands were fastened to them. The room was very dark, though, and I could make out the shapes of the pigs all around me. But instead of being on a table, the pigs were arranged on a long black container, and as I, was started, and as I started to realize what it was, the fingers propelling my legs tightened and moved me closer. I felt the same horrible force taking control of my arms. I couldn't stop the hands from moving down to the lid of the box. When I touched it, my hands went cold, and I knew I was about to open a coffin. I started to cry and plead and call to God to stop me as the lid began to rise. That was when I woke up screaming. Right then and there, I should have known it was a dream with that dream was an omen of death. Lorraine! What's going on in there? I called from the sofa where I was admiring how clean everything looked. I heard John rummaging through the closets in the kitchen and a banging of bottles. I went to see what he was doing and he had the kitchen table loaded with all the beer in the house. It wasn't enough to keep the stork club in business, but there were quite a few quarts of beer and some wine. John, what are you doing? Is there any more beer in the ice box? What's going on? He opened the refrigerator himself and counted about nine loose cans of beer. Then he slammed the door and went into the living room to the telephone. We're going to have a few friends over for drinks tonight. Are you crazy? Just a few intimate friends for a quiet little drink. Don't you think Mr. Pignati wants us to have a social life? 
He smiled, his great big eyes glowing. 